Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are very happy to welcome you to this briefing this afternoon, talking about public attitudes about climate change and clean energy. And of course, it's a very fitting topic as we think about the State of the Union is about to be delivered tonight. So this is an issue that may very well be addressed in some way during the State of the Union. It certainly is on the minds of policymakers as we look at many of the issues that are confronting the Congress and confronting state and local leaders uh, as we deal with more and more issues around energy and climate. We are very pleased to be holding this briefing uh, today and as a result of new work that has been done by Professor John Krosnick. Some of you may have been at previous briefings where uh, Professor Krosnick has talked about his findings and we think that it is a very, very good opportunity to hear sort of the latest, get those perceptions, to have a better understanding of what the American public is saying across the country and across a whole range of demographics that make it all very interesting to learn more about what the current state of, of thinking really is. And of course, there are always more questions that need to be asked. We're going to hear uh, a lot of new information today. And of course, this work that has uh, just been completed in December had been commissioned through the re uh, uh, resources uh, for the future and USA Today. Uh, and so we are very, very pleased also to be holding this briefing in conjunction with Resources for the Future and to have the president of RFF here with us to also make comments at this afternoon and to provide some very, very useful context, I think, particularly for, for policymakers since we have someone who was a very prominent policymaker um, who is now leading RFF. So at this time, without further ado, I would like to turn to Dr. Krosnick, who has been looking at public opinion for more than 30 years, looking at how the American public attitudes are formed, how they are shaped, how they are changing, and how it affects their thinking and action, and how it may indeed affect how policymakers feel. He's been an expert, recognized uh, worldwide, uh, looking at the psychology of attitudes, particularly in the area of politics, and has been a co-principal investigator of the American National Election Study, which has been a preeminent research project exploring voter decision making. So, Dr. Krasnick. Thank you very much, Carol, and welcome to you all. It's really a pleasure to be back in this building, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this new work that we've done. I want to just begin by letting you know who you should join me in thanking for what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, I'm very grateful to Resources for the Future and Pete Nelson there in particular, who's been a collaborator in this project and uh, who made this all possible. Um, Stanford and the Woods Institute for the Environment in particular has been a supporter in USA Today. Our, our polling partner there, Jim Norman has been uh, at very important in pulling this off as well. The research staff includes Yu Shuang Wang at RFF and my longtime collaborator at Stanford, Bo McInnes. And so I wanted to thank all of those folks as well as Alan Krupnik and Ray Kopp at RFF. So any questions you have about details, feel free to ask any of those people. Um, so um, what we're going to do today is begin with a point of deep embarrassment and concern for me. And this has nothing to do with climate change at the moment. Let me just show you this graph. Um, this looks complicated. It's really not that, that complicated. It's very simple. These are poll results taken between April of 2010 and April of 2011 asking the American public a very simple question. Was Barack Obama born in the United States or born in another country? Okay? And the y-axis over here is the percent of people who gave the right answer, in a, a, the, who said that he was born in the United States. And you can see that each of these little uh, objects represents a poll measurement, and the lines connect up measurements made with the same survey question. 
So if we just look back here in April 2010, you can see that according to this survey, the per percent of giving the correct answer was about 78 percent in the country. According to this measurement, it was 64 percent. And according to this one, it was 58 percent. So you can see very substantial disagreements between these low numbers and these high numbers. But the, what the lines show you is that there is consistency in question wording. If you ask the same question at different times, you get very similar answers. So that to take those lines out and, and to make these all dots, you would say, what a mess, why should I believe polling? Who knows what the American public believes? But actually what I'm showing you is that question wording matters. And that's an obsession for us, and it's particularly important with regard to climate change, because this is a comparable graph here with dots and no lines, showing you between 1986 and 2013, many national polls asking Americans in one way or another, has the earth been warming or not? And you can see that even most recently, these measurements range from dots around 50 percent to dots around 80 percent or 90 percent. So if you were wondering, should I pay attention to polls, you might look at data like this and say, why would I bother? Because who knows if there's any truth there. But the fact of the matter is, if I were to connect dots with the same wordings here as well, you'd see the same thing. Consistency over time and results. And what I'm going to do is to walk you through results that we get with a set of questions that are based on 100 years of literature developing across the social sciences in how to design questions to minimize bias and measure what people really think as accurately as we can. So that's what we're going to do. And to put it in context, I'm just going to show you one recent headline. This happens to come from NBC News. Number of Americans who don't believe in climate change rises. And this is dated just January 16th of 2014. So this is reporting the result of a poll. So let's, is it true that skepticism is on the rise? Let us find out. So what I'm going to do is walk you through a series of national surveys that we have done, and the great focus here is on the newest one. So the newest one, as I mentioned, is co-sponsored by Resources for the Future, USA Today, and Stanford. The, the data were collected uh, very recently in, in uh, November and December um, at the end of last year. And we've asked lots of new questions exploring lots of new issues that we haven't in our surveys before. But we've also asked a number of questions that we have asked quite often that allow us to track trends over time. So in these surveys, the surveys beginning as early as 1997 and going through 2013, these are always with representative random samples of American adults who are interviewed by telephone, landlines and cell phones are called. We randomly select a respondent from among the household residents so that we don't have a bias toward people who are at home at the time of the call. And we call back as many times as we need to in order to interview the randomly selected respondent. Um, we also work hard at asking unbiased, balanced questions. Um, so to begin, what I want to show you is a, an update on where Americans are now on what I call the fundamentals. Has warming been happening? Has it been caused by humans? And is it a threat? Okay. And here's the wording of the question that we've been asking for a long time to measure the first of those. You may have heard about the idea that the world's temperature may have been going up slowly over the past 100 years. What's your personal opinion on this? Do you think this probably has been happening or do you think it probably has not been happening? Now, one, uh, I'll tell you before I show you results, we've done a series of experiments where people are randomly assigned either to be asked this question or an alternative version of it. So one is a quicker one that gets rid of this introductory sentence and simply begins, what's your personal opinion? Do you think that uh, the world's temperature has been going up slowly over the past 100 years or do you think it probably has not been happening? So that's a quicker version of it. We've also done experiments where we remove the word slowly because, as you may know, over the period of 100 years, natural scientists talk about the hockey stick and that it's actually not been so slow in recent decades. Uh, that turns out not to make a substantial difference either. And here is what we get with our latest figures. So starting in 1997, 77% of people said that they thought the Earth's temperature probably had been going up. That number went up to the mid-80s in 2007 and 2008, went down a little bit, went up a little bit, down, up, and the latest number is 73%. So let's just stop there for a second. As compared to November 2012, a year later in December 2013, this number is essentially flat as compared to the recent past. So if I look at this, 
as a student of public opinion on lots of issues, not just climate, the thing that jumps out to me is a gigantic ma majority. On so many issues, we're used to seeing America divided nearly 50-50, and yet on this issue, on this particular question, they're not. But you might say, okay, fine. There, there are lots of people acknowledge that warming is happening. The real debate is about whether the warming has been caused by human activity. So we've asked, if warming has been occurring over the last 100 years, do you think it's been caused mostly by things people have done, mostly by natural processes, or about equally by both? And here are the results we see for that. So when we first asked the question in 1997, 81% of people attributed warming to human activity. That number is 80% in our most recent survey. Okay, so let's just stop for a second and take a breath. What have I shown you? I've shown you big numbers, and I've shown you not much change over time, despite Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, Al Gore's movie, a big recession in 2008, Mo millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars spent on advertising to try to push around the American public in one direction or another on each of these issues. Candidates running for president saying, I don't think it's real. Lots of messages attempting to sway the American public. And what you can see is that the public has remained relatively steady on these issues over time. Now, when we put these two things together, identifying people who say, yes, warming has been happening and it's been caused by humans, you see these numbers started off at 66% in 1997, 2013 at 65% really no meaningful change over that time period. So somebody tells you, oh, surveys, you can't trust surveys. You do the same survey twice, you get completely different answers. Well, here we are doing the same survey. How many times is this? 10 times or more? And you get pretty much the same answer each time. When we ask people, if nothing is done to address it, do you think the Earth's temperature will go up over future years? Or do you think it will not happen? We see, when we first asked it in 2010, 75% of Americans said they thought it would occur. That number, 76% in 2013. Again, a large majority and no notable change over time. Now, this is beginning to look at the question of seriousness. So we asked people, if the Earth's temperature were to rise by 5 degrees Fahrenheit over the next 75 years, would that be overall a good thing, a bad thing, or neither good nor bad? And here I'm showing you the percentage of people who said it would be a bad thing. Started off at 61% in 1997, 66% today. Now that's one particular version of warming, but we can ask about it in terms of people's perceptions more broadly. How serious of a problem do you think global warming will be for the United States in the future? In 2006, 83% of people said it would be a serious problem. For the country, that number at 81% today. When we asked that same question about the world, 85% said it would be a serious problem in 2006 when we first asked it, 83% today. Again, very large numbers. When we asked people, do you think global warming will hurt you personally or will it not hurt you personally? Here we see smaller numbers, only about a little less than two-thirds of Americans have said they thought that they would personally be hurt by it. But when we ask, will it hurt future generations, the numbers go right up back to the territory that we had seen before. So people recognize uh, that in not all cases is this about them personally, but they think more about it in terms of future generations being affected, which I think many scientists would agree with. Now, I've told you so far about perceptions of the state of the world. What I haven't told you about is how certain people are in their holding of these opinions. So I could ask you, do you think Barack Obama was born in the United States or not? And you could tell me, yeah, I think he probably was, but what do I know? You know, this is not something I hold with a lot of confidence. And we now know from about 50 years of research in psychology that people's beliefs and preferences held weekly are not as consequential as strongly held beliefs and attitudes. So we have actually asked people, how sure are you about your beliefs? And I'll show you here that when we just offer people a five-point scale, extremely sure, very sure, moderately sure, slightly sure, not sure at all, that uh, between 43% in the original measurement and 44% today place themselves in one of the top two categories. Now, obviously, uh, a question about long-term 
warming in the past or in the future is an issue for natural scientists to uh, provide information about. And for you to say, I'm absolutely certain, you, I mean, it, you haven't seen it firsthand, you may have seen graphs and so on. So I'm not, I'm not sure that it's unreasonable for Americans to be less than highly certain about this. But there certainly is more room for certainty to go up. Efforts, however, at enhancing uncertainty over these years, I would say, have not been successful at a national level. That is, arguments being made, yeah, yeah, the planet's warming, but we don't really know what's causing it. We don't really know what to do about it. Americans have not become any more uncertain over time. Um, here I'll show you a relatively high bar. These are people who are extremely or very sure that global warming has been happening and has been caused by human activities. That's about one-third of the country who are rock solid in holding each of those beliefs. And again, no notable change over time from 31 percent to 36 percent. Here's the hardcore skeptic group. These are people who are extremely or very sure that warming has not been happening. And you can see this is a tiny fraction of the country, 7% in 1997, 8% today. It really has not varied notably at all, but it's certainly a group that we hear frequently. Okay, let's stop there. So what have I shown you? These are the fundamentals so far. I've shown you that the endorsement of the existence and human causality is very widespread. Certainty is certainly not maxing out, but the group of certain skeptics is quite small. Now, what about government action? Are people in favor of government doing something about this? Well, the first thing I I'll show you is a, a very general question, asking people, do you think the federal government should do more than it's doing now, less than it's doing now, or about what it's doing now about global warming? And you can see that back in 1997, about 67% of people said the government should be doing more. That number is 66% today. Little ups and downs in between, but no wavering there. Um, when we asked in particular about whether government should limit greenhouse gas emissions by businesses, that got endorsement by 83% in 2009, 81% today. Now let me just pause here because this is quite a striking finding, I think. That as you know, there's tremendous variation in political ideology across the spectrum from liberal to conservative in the United States. And people on the conservative end of the spectrum in the general public tend to endorse smaller, less interventionist government. But you can't see numbers as high as these unless there are majorities of Democrats and independents and Republicans saying the same thing. The math just doesn't add up. And I'm not going to show you anything about the party divisions today with these data. That'll be the next installment of our work with this survey data set. But I will tell you, when you look at big numbers like this, you can anticipate what I'll tell you next time, which is that even majorities of Republican citizens express these points of view. Otherwise, you just can't get results that look like this. Um, OK. Should the federal government limit greenhouse gas emissions by power plants? Now, this happens to be a question that we started asking in 2006 in our surveys. Little did we know that the federal government would turn its attention to uh, existing source power plants very recently as a mechanism to reduce emissions. As you can see, this was an idea supported by 86% of Americans in 2006. That number is 79% today. When we asked let's see, I don't think I have a slide for this, when we asked um, our respondents, should the federal government limit emissions by power plants only if Congress consents to that, or even if Congress does not consent, the majority of our folks said they should go ahead and do it regardless of whether Congress consents. So that's an interesting issue there. So here are now a series of questions asking, do you think the federal government should either require businesses or encourage them with tax breaks to do a series of things, or should the government stay out of each of these? And what you can see is very high levels of support, uh, starting off in excess of 80% and ending up around 80% for a series of different proposals, reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions by power plants, building, uh, these, this is just enhancing cafe standards for vehicles, building buildings that require less energy to heat and cool, building appliances that use less electricity. Each of these very popular, even when we tell our survey respondents that it will cost them more money to impose each of these standards. 
Uh, the only one that's not quite so popular, as you can see here, is building all electric vehicles. This has never been as popular as other strategies. We have not explored in depth what causes this to be less popular, but you could easily imagine, uh, despite the, the rising sales of those vehicles, we don't yet have charging stations everywhere. Gas stations are not prepared to swap out batteries. So it it's may be that uh, technology needs to change before support for that mechanism increases. Here are a series of other questions that each involve taxes. So let me begin by focusing your attention at the bottom. Um, you may know that economists uh, propose that if you want to change behavior, one of the ways to do it is to change the cost of that behavior. So if you want to reduce the amount of gasoline people burn or the amount of electricity they use, just increase the cost to them. And of course, they'll turn the light switches off more and they will uh, drive less. Uh, as it turns out, only very small portions of Americans like the idea of increases tax, increasing taxes on gasoline or electricity simply to reduce use of them. So this, the, at this point in our most recent survey measuring this, these numbers were at about uh, 25 to 28 percent. Um, these other policies offering tax breaks to utilities to produce more electricity from water, wind, and solar power, very high levels of approval across this time period offering tax breaks to reduce air pollution from burning coal, less popular, but still a majority in support. And I'll show you a little bit later um, why I think this is a little bit less popular. Offering tax breaks to build nuclear power plants is even less appealing. Um, when we asked in particular about an idea for the first time we've never asked about before, this is imposing carbon taxes on businesses. So when we asked, do you think businesses should be charged a tax for each uh, unit of greenhouse gases they are responsible for emitting, this idea achieved support from only 49% of the sample. So again, this is not a particularly popular idea, the idea of either taxing consumers or taxing businesses. And I would propose to you, although I have no evidence of this, that one possible explanation is as follows. If the federal government were to increase taxes on gasoline or on electricity or to impose a carbon tax on businesses, there's only one guaranteed result from that. Prices will go up. There is no guarantee that emissions will go down. So Americans would have to have taken economics courses and believe in the logic of the economic analysis in order to see that. And it may be that from their point of view, they're not guaranteed the benefit for the guaranteed cost. One possibility. We explored two possible ideas that might explain why nuclear power plants are not as appealing as other methods. The first was we asked people, do you think that nuclear power, generating electricity from nuclear power puts out fewer greenhouse gases than using coal, oil, or natural gas puts out the same or more. And what you can see is that only 60% of Americans said that they thought nuclear power was responsible for less greenhouse gas emissions. I'm told that natural scientists say that is the right answer to this question. And uh, that's an interesting point for uh, educating the public, that to make nuclear power a more viable alternative, uh, perhaps people need to learn that it is less responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the natural inclination you and I might have is to say, well, probably the reason people are not so positive about uh, nuclear power is because of the safety risks that they might perceive, especially following the Fukushima accident, which has certainly gotten its share of publicity. Um, but as you can see, only 55 percent, uh, excuse me, that 55 percent of people said that safety risks are not a reason to prevent the building of nuclear power plants. That is a minority, only 45 percent of Americans uh, oppose nuclear power because of safety concerns. So this, uh, for us, raises interesting questions about how to investigate a little bit more. Where does that negativity come from? Because, um, you know, we're not seeing the support for nuclear power as a way to address this that one might imagine. Um, now, I want to tell you a little bit about general posturing toward other sources of energy. When we ask people, do you think that the federal government should or should not pay part of the cost for people to put solar panels on their homes, 68% of Americans supported that strategy. 
Um, we also asked questions about cap and trade, and I'm going to show you three different versions of the cap and trade question. We did an experiment here, so for those of you who are not familiar with experimental methodology, in about 90 seconds, seconds you will be, what we do is we have the computer randomly assign each survey respondent to get version A, version B, or version C of the question. What that means is that those three groups of people are identical in every way, except for the way this question has been asked. And I'm going to show you why, because we wanted to explore whether changing the wording would change answers that we got. So here's the first version. It's a little bit long, so let me read it to you, and I apologize for the unreadable red here. There is a proposed system called cap and trade. The government would issue permits limiting the amount of greenhouse gases companies can put out. Companies that did not use all their permits could sell them to other companies. Companies that need more permits can buy them or these companies can pay money to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that other people or organizations put out. This will cause companies to figure out the cheapest way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Would you favor or oppose a cap and trade system to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that companies put out? So I'm, again, I apologize, it's a little hard to read these words, but it says this will cause. So as you can see, that's an assertion. And it's an assertion based on economic theory, and research and observations over decades. But it's an assertion made by us, the survey question writers. So the second version of the cap and trade question changes those words. Wow, and you really can't read this. Uh, what it says is, instead of this will cause, it says economists say that this system is likely to cause. Okay, so the whole question is the same, except we've just changed this will cause to economists say that this system is likely to. Now you should realize this was a bold move for resources for the future, an organization filled with economists to see what difference does it make to say economists say that it's likely to versus saying that it will. Here's version C of the question, and again, I'm sorry, this is hard to read. That same phrase, economists say that this system is likely to, is in place there. But we added another sentence, because this converts cap and trade into cap and dividend. It is, the money the government makes from selling the permits would be returned to all Americans equally by reducing the amount of income taxes they pay. So prices go up, and then you get a rebate. Okay? So what we're going to look at is, does introducing economists change evaluations and does introducing the dividend change evaluations and here are the results version a 59 percent support version b i'm sorry to say statistically significant decline shifting to uncertainty 48 percent but look at this gigantic almost 20 percentage point increase by including the dividend in the process so the of course as you know at least my understanding is that the the proposals to tax carbon consumption don't hinge on that money disappearing so the idea of it being available in the form of dividends somehow um, is plausible, and it's advocated by some in this space, and it looks like a good number of Americans can be converted, even in the face of the uncertainty, to see this as a favorable way to go. Next, we asked about the tax breaks that you know are in place now for various industries. So companies that make electricity from sunlight, wind, and water, should these uh, tax breaks continue? 73% said yes. Should government subsidies to oil companies continue? Only 31% of Americans said yes. And natural gas companies come out in between at about 55%. So this is the first hint from questions that we've asked directly here about a preference for solar, wind, and water over oil. But to me, the most surprising results of this entire survey come from a set of questions that we would never asked before, and I don't know of others who have asked them. We simply asked people, do you think making electricity from each of the following sources is a good idea, a bad idea, or neither good nor bad? And let me show you what we saw in a moment. But before we get there, on the way to it, let me show you the result that we saw about the Keystone Pipeline. When we asked, we described to people the Keystone Pipeline, we asked them, do you think the federal government should allow the Keystone Pipeline to be built or not? 56% of people said they thought it should be built. So um, this is another instance in which um, we are seeing support for this approach. Other organizations, the Pew Research Center and others, have seen similar numbers approving. Um, oops, sorry, I guess I gave, I gave you a, a heads up to questions that will come in a minute. So we'll, we'll get to those generation methods shortly. So before we get there, Will government action be painful? You might be wondering uh, about the argument 
that taking steps to address climate change would hurt the American economy, would cost jobs, would hurt, hurt our uh, international competitiveness. As you can see, when we ask people, do you think the U.S. doing things about global warming would hurt the national economy, would help the national economy, or would have no impact, you can see that the percent of people saying we would hurt ourselves economically was 2000, uh, it was 27 percent in 2009, 30 percent in 2013. No substantial change. This is not an argument that has caught on with the American public. Secondly, should the U.S. take action on this issue to reduce emissions, even if other large nations generating greenhouse gas emissions such as China and India do not, or should the U.S. only do it if those other countries do? And the answer is about two-thirds or more in our most recent survey, three-quarters of Americans said the U.S. should take action regardless of whether those other large emitting countries do or not. What about the effects of climate change? We asked about a series of effects. For example, do you think global warming has caused there to be more droughts, fewer droughts, or had no impact on droughts? And you can see that only a bare majority of people see impact on droughts so far in 2012 and 2013. When we asked the same question about storms, about the same results, 55% in 2012, 62% in 2013. If you think Superstorm Sandy as a single event would change people's opinions, you might imagine they would, this number would increase a lot. It didn't. It is a significant increase, but it's not a substantial one. Single events like that don't seem to push people around. Uh, however, when we ask people, do you think super st that, that uh, Hurricane Sandy caused the damage uh, excuse me, let me say it one more time. Do you think that global warming caused the damage from Hurricane Sandy to be worse or not? 57% of people did say they thought it was enhanced in terms of its damage. When we ask people, do you think you've seen any effects of global warming so far? Again, a health healthy majority, 71%, said they think they have seen some effects. And I won't spend too much time on this. I just want to highlight for you, these are the effects that people mention. So increasing natural disasters are effects that 25% of Americans say they think they have seen from climate change so far. Changes in weather or weather patterns by 22%. Icebergs melting by 20%. Warmer temperatures being caused by climate change, 19%. And smaller numbers talking about precipitation, ocean rise, snow polar bears, and so on. So uh, my point here is to say lots of people think they've seen some effects of climate change, but they are diverse in nature. There's no single effect that is visible for people, despite attempts, I think, by some observers to link particularly dramatic events to climate change so far. As you may know, one of the arguments sometimes made by people trying to whip up public concern about this issue is that extreme weather events are the answer. If we want to get Americans concerned, we just need to really play up events like Hurricane Sandy. So when we ask people, uh, do you think the world's weather patterns have been more unstable, less unstable, or about the same in recent years, as you can see, about 70% in 2006 said they had been more unstable recently. That number is 62% in 2013. There's no evidence that Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy altered numbers like this. One single event, even the typhoon in the Philippines, does not seem to be enough to alter people's perceptions of weather instability. Okay. Now, as you may know, the skeptical lobbying effort, uh, in part on this issue, has attempted to discredit natural scientists working in the area. And one of the things that we've done is to ask people how much they trust scientists studying the environment and global warming in particular over time. And as you can see, these are uh, ratings from a, uh, from a rating scale. These are respondents putting uh, natural scientists at the top three points on this rating scale, starting out at about 72%, 64%, here in 2013. If you want to look at this graph and ignore this number and say 75 down to about 70 down to about 65, you can see a small trend downward in these numbers. 
But there, I, I personally would not see this as a huge headline myself. I would say that trust in scientists has been high and has remained relatively steady over this time period. The last question of this set, should we take steps now to prepare for the possible effects of climate change or should we wait and see? You could easily imagine that some people would say, you know, look, that no scientist can know for sure what's going to happen 10 or 50 years from now, so why would we want to invest in preparing for those problems if that money might be wasted? Why don't we just wait and see what happens? In fact, what we see is a breathtaking 83% of Americans saying we should take steps now to prepare for the possible effects rather than taking chances by waiting for the future. Okay, this finally brings us to what I found to be the, at least for me personally, the knock my socks off findings of this survey. So when we ask people, is it a good idea, a bad idea, or neither good nor bad to produce energy from a series of different sources, here's what we see. 91% of Americans saying solar power is a good idea, 84% saying wind is a good idea, 83% saying hydroelectricity is a good idea, natural gas dropping to 48, nuclear power at 33, and coal down at 21. Now, this is an interesting set of results, given that, as you may know, coal is remarkably inexpensive as a source of electricity. This is the American public saying, okay, I understand it's cheap, but to me it doesn't sound like a good idea. This looks like a public to me saying they prefer to move in this direction rather than in this direction. Is this all, All the entire country, yeah. I, everything I've shown you so far is the entire country. Okay, now we're coming into the home stretch here. I'm almost done. I want to show you just a couple of, of last uh, tidbits. And this, was a, this is a bite, but it's a big bite. Um, as you may know, uh, about a month ago, we released a new set of results that I'm just going to share with you now. So these are not exactly new, but for those of you who haven't seen them, I want you to get a taste of it. Um, the message I heard talking to people in this building repeatedly over time is that national surveys like what I've shown you so far are interesting and helpful, but not nearly as helpful as are needed. Because each elected representative in the House and Senate represents a particular geographically located constituency, and I may tell them what the nation as a whole thinks, but I'm not telling you them what their constituents think. So we developed a technique where we concatenate surveys together, put 22,000 respondents into a single analysis, break them up by state, so we have random samples of people in almost all the states, and then we've produced maps showing the percent of people in each state who hold each of a series dif of different beliefs. So here's the first map, and uh, next time we'll invest in a more modern projector so you can see it a little more sharply. But uh, the darker the state, the bigger the majority saying that global warming has been happening in answer to our question. And I'll make your task of looking at these maps a little quicker and more efficient by telling you we didn't find a single state that was majority skeptical on climate change across the different measures that we looked at. Um, instead, what we see is uh, either bare majorities or large majorities or huge majorities on the green side of the issue. In this case, the numbers range from as small as 75% to as high as 88%. And you can see that the darker states tend to be around the edges of the country in this case. We do not. I'm so sorry. Not that we don't like Hawaii and Alaska, but we didn't have numbers to be able to do that. We need to have interviewed enough people in those places in order to do it. Um, well, we didn't. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few more of these maps quickly, but they all tell basically the same picture. This is uh, whether warming will continue in the future. Numbers range from 60% to 82%. And by the way, states like this that have no number, we don't, we don't have enough respondents in those states to actually produce a reliable estimate. Whether warming has been caused by human activity, they, these numbers range from 65% to 92%. Whether warming will be a serious national problem, ranging from 58% to 94%. Okay. And there are lots of maps. I'm going to go too quickly for you to read them, but they all tell the same story. Now, what about engagement in the issue? How much attention have people been paying? How strong are their feelings? 
Well, this is showing you the percent of people in each state who say the issue of global warming is extremely important to them personally. These are the people who wake up in the morning and say another day, another opportunity to influence government on climate change. There are people who are skeptical about climate change and there are people who are green on the issue. And you can see that these numbers vary from a low of 3% to a high of 16%. These are the people who vote based on the issue. These are the people who give money to lobbying organizations on the issue. They write letters. They make phone calls. And these groups are about typical. For most issues that get a lot of attention in the Congress, gun control, abortion, capital punishment, and others, the small group of passionately engaged people is about this same size. Um, this shows you the, uh, another measure of engagement. Uh, percent of people who say that they are highly knowledgeable about the issue. These numbers range from 29% to 69%. And you can see some states are more involved and knowledgeable, at least according to their own assessments, than others. Okay. Um, I'm not going to show you these maps, but they're just like all the rest of them, showing you lots of support for policies. So in each of those cases, without spending time on details, there's no, there's no state that comes out majority skeptical. Now you might imagine that states like West Virginia or Texas, places where there are significant economic interests in uh, fossil fuels, that there would be skepticism about this issue. But those are also places that are warm. Those are places that are along coastlines. There are various different competing factors that are at play. And there are places that know the dangers of heat. And so what we find in our analysis is that economic interests play only a small role, if any, in governing the opinions that people express. So what conclusions can we reach? Well, first of all, opinions have been overwhelmingly green, I think, on the issue and have remained relatively steady over a period of years, despite many events that speculators thought might have influenced opinions that hardcore skeptics remain a tiny fraction of the nation, that all states that we were able to look at are a majority green. There's no state that's a majority skeptical on the issue. And the clear message for more than 80% of Americans is to prepare for the likely effects of climate change now, not to wait and see and deal with those problems later. Solar, wind, and water are viewed favorably by the vast, vast, vast majority of people as sources of, of uh, electricity. Coal is viewed favorably by a very small fraction of the country. Um, and the message is clear from Americans to end subsidies for the coal industry, while at the same time continuing government subsidies for solar, wind, and water power generation and supporting the installation of solar panels on homes. OK, so um, thank you for your patience. Let me uh, say I appreciate the, uh, your, your time and working through these details. These are, in some sense, very new results, but at the same time, they are results that reinforce a picture we've seen for some time. The American public stands uh, clearly on one side of this issue, in my opinion, based on these measurements. And I'm privileged to have had the opportunity to do this measurement again. I thank RFF and USA Today, and I thank you. And we can do questions later, I think. Is that right? Always fascinating, John. And before we open it up for uh, discussion with, with all of you, uh, we want to take a few minutes to hear from somebody to, who can to set uh, all of this in a bit more of a context from a policymaker perspective. And we are delighted that we've been joined this afternoon by Phil Sharp, who is the president of Resources for the Future. And prior to uh, being at RFF, uh, Phil had served in the House of Representatives for 10 terms as a representative from Indiana. And during part of that time, he also chaired the Energy and Power Subcommittee of the House Energy Committee. And then he also had taught at Harvard at, at the Institute of Politics and at the Kennedy School. So while he was in Congress, he was always very, very well known for uh, being heavily engaged in uh, trying to reach across the aisle, doing so much policy work on energy in a very uh, bipartisan way. And so I think that in 
his uh, many, many years of public service and now in terms of uh, being president of RFF, he brings a very unique perspective in terms of what does this mean now that we've heard Professor Krosnick say all these things, what, what should or how might policymakers respond to this? Phil? Well, Carol, thank you very much, and thank you, John, uh, for your uh, not just work on this particular poll, but uh, <coughs> previous work as well. And I'm delighted to be uh, uh, back here. Um, frankly, as a former member of Congress, I'm delighted to be invited just about anywhere. <laughs> uh, but um, I I'm just going to take a couple minutes, and then we're going to open up to your questions and your comments. And, and some of what I'll say probably is very obvious to folks in this audience. First, I just need to say a word about resources for the future. We are a 60-year-old research organization in which we do independent, we believe, high-quality uh, research uh, analysis, primarily through an economic lens on environmental and natural resource issues. But we are not an advocacy organization. Our independent scholars can take their own points of view from their research. They do present them here on Capitol Hill. We do lots of work on climate, on uh, electricity issues, on energy issues, on land and water issues and, uh, and the things. So there's a wide diversity, but we do not, as an organization, take an opinion. So please don't hold anything I say against the organization. Uh, these will be my own uh, uh, personal uh, points of view, and partly from wearing my previous hat in the last millennia uh, when I was uh, a member of the Congress here. Uh, let me say, I, I do want to just say, and you may be interested in <clears throat> looking at some of our work uh, on this, we have done analytical work on virtually all of the major policy proposals at the federal and state level for dealing with climate change. We're doing lots of work right now on the carbon tax. We're uh, doing on the tax changes that the Finance and the Ways and Means Committee are, are talking about. We're doing lots of work on the EPA, proposed rules that are in, in development on uh, carbon rules uh, kind of thing. We've done work on the clean energy standard. We did a lot of work on the cap and trade and actually had some of our work at, uh, turned up in the legislation uh, that was considered here on Capitol Hill. But let me just say a couple, I think, that are obvious things. And one is that this poll and other data shows overwhelmingly the American people are not the issue as to where they stand on this question. The American people, as much as on almost any other issue, show very strong concern and support for government action. And I don't think there's any way to get around uh, this. One can argue over what that action ought to be, how intense it ought to be, when it ought to happen, all kinds of questions. But the fact that some commentators talk about having to wait for the American people to catch up, this is pure baloney. The, uh, the question is whether American leaders of whole stripes, whether it's partisan or whether it's uh, in business or whether it's in academia or wherever, whether leadership groups in this country are willing to come to a more activist uh, point of view, and many are, of course, on that. Second thing I would simply uh, say is one uh, figure I don't believe John brought up uh, today that's in there that was, to me, one of the more politically surprising things, that when asked the question, do you think the U.S. government ought to take action even if other governments, like China, are not uh, taking action, and of course this is a natural competitive concern of anybody in the policy arena on this issue, the public said, yes, you ought to take action, something like 75% said we ought to act even if others are slow to act. Now, I hope you know that many other governments are actually being more active than we are. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is, I think that is a politically significant proposition. And I also think that, um, that as, as the current debate has swirled now and will swirl for the next two years around the EPA initiatives, I think it's very clear there's very strong public support for government taking action. That doesn't mean people are going to dictate or know exactly which action ought to be taken. But what I suggest to you is that this leaves room in the American political uh, system for actions by people that want to engage in this issue in a serious and informed way. And uh, I think that's the real test for Capitol Hill, and it's the real test for the American communication system as to whether we are going to continue to engage in willful ignorance on this issue or whether we are going to try to, like adults, uh, examine uh, the facts as best we can 
and, uh, and, and actually deal with the serious questions of what are the practical steps that we ought to take and when ought to we take them and who's hurt and who's helped and what, what do we want to do. These are tough political questions to be worked out. There's plenty to argue about. But the nonsense, the continuing argument over science or weight or whatnot, it seems to me is pretty well settled in the public mind, in the scientific community, and in the academic world. So. Great. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> well, let's open it up for your questions and comments. And if you would just identify yourself, please, when you ask your question. And I must say, I thought there were so many interesting things that John presented. And um, I don't know about you, but I could have listened to him for another half hour easily in terms of looking at all of those maps and everything. Any questions or comments? Go ahead. If you, if you could identify yourself. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, my name is John Weinberger. I'm a, a freelance uh, policy consultant. And uh, my question has to do with the... Um, the, the the debate that we that we've seen t seems to center around environment versus jobs or you know advocates for clean energy talk about green jobs and uh, opponents talk about petroleum jobs and co coal jobs and and I'm wondering if a any of the polling data asks any questions about the interaction but whether people feel like uh, uh, doing something in ter with clean energy is a threat to their uh, you know economic security. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've asked questions in a number of surveys, including the most recent one, about whether uh, doing things to address climate change would cause there to be more jobs, would cause there to be fewer jobs, or would have no impact on the number of jobs in the country as a whole and in the respondent's own state. And what we found is that only a small minority, 20 to 30 percent of people, say that they think it will, that doing things about climate change will reduce the number of jobs in the country and in the state. And in fact, the plurality, almost 50 percent of respondents have said uh, they think that doing things about climate change will increase the number of jobs both in their own state and in the country as a whole. So it looks like the argument that uh, addressing this issue is a job creator rather than a job killer seems to have caught on with more people, about twice as many people uh, as accept the, the uh, skeptical view. I was interested, uh, Dina Stoner, uh, Cooperative Finance uh, Cooperation. Um, I was interested in two questions, and I'd like to ask you uh, about uh, affordability. When you ask about preference for different fuels, the public clearly preferred renewables. But when you went to the specific strategies, the three alternatives, which was very clever, and you ask whether or not people would like to have a strategy that took the, re the taxes being paid or whatever, taxes small t, and give it back in terms of dividends, indicates that there is a concern about getting money back. Did you ask any questions around affordability? Do, do people in the survey understand that some of these other ones that they prefer might have cost implications? Just curious. Yep, thank you. Uh, so this is obviously a, an important issue, and we've gotten at it a number of different ways in our most recent survey and in earlier ones. So I'll summarize the results for you. I would, I would have been happy to keep you here. If I had Carol's permission, I would have been happy to give two more hours of presentation, but I thought I should keep it to, to the limit. Uh, the, the, by the way, you can see uh, there on, on our webpage at Stanford, there are videos of many past presentations that I've done on this that go into detail on uh, many of these issues, and you're more than welcome to, to look at them. It's actually the website for what's called the Political Psychology Research Group at Stanford, PPRG. Um, so to answer your question, um, first of all, we have looked at um, uh, one of the concerns you expressed, which is we can ask about policies that will, in fact, according to experts, cost consumers money if they're imposed. So, for example, some people argue that cafe standards increasing the fuel efficiency of automobiles would increase the cost of cars, uh, while perhaps decreasing the cost of the fuel that people end up buying. The, uh, 
when we have experimented in actually telling people that it would increase cost to them, we don't see public support for those policies going down notably. More importantly, we've done a series of measurements using a technique called contingent valuation, which is a well-established 60-year-old technique in survey research, where we describe to people a, a benefit that they might get, um, which is, in this case, the description of the uh, reduced emissions that could be produced by a policy. And we describe a cost very specifically in terms of dollars to their household. So we say, for example, we could reduce uh, U.S. emissions by 80 percent by 2050, but it would cost your household a about $180 per year in increased cost of the goods and services you buy. If you could vote for or against this policy, how would you vote? So this is an opportunity to find out when you tell people specifically what the benefit is, and specifically what the cost is, how do they react? So the first thing I want to tell you is that when we randomly assign each respondent to be told one of a series of different prices, so some people might be told $100 a year, others might be told $150 a year, others might be told $250 a year, the people who get the higher prices vote yes less often. So just as economic theory would suggest, when the price goes up, people are less and less willing to buy it. What that suggests to us is they're paying attention. They are aware. They're not willing to pay an unlimited amount for this. However, what we find is that using um, EPA and uh, CBO computations of the likely cost of emissions reductions of that magnitude, that when we aggregate up the amount of money the American public says they're willing to pay by their yes and no votes, the public is willing to pay just enough to cover those costs. Um, so that, to me, is pretty telling. Uh, it, it, we have evidence that people are answering the question thoughtfully, responding to the price being provided. And we don't get 80 or 90 percent voting yes. When we tell them it's going to cost even $100 a year, we get only about 65 percent of people voting yes. But those people, the amount of money they're willing to pay, multiplied out by how many households there are in the country, provides enough money to cover the costs. Um, hi, my name is Molly. I work at the EPA. Um, so I'm happy to see that the majority of Americans support renewable energy sources. And I'm curious if you asked about uh, do they know where their electricity comes from and do are they aware of other options that they can make that choice? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We actually started doing research, Ray Kopp and I, on this issue back in the 1990s. And one of the very first things that we did was to give uh, Americans a quiz asking them, what percent of American electricity do you think comes from each of a series of different sources? And uh, it was embarrassing back in those days that uh, Americans really were not in touch. And what I used to be able to do when I gave lectures or in teaching courses is I could give that quiz to people. I could say, you know, you, so put up your hand when I say a series of, of different sources of electricity. Tell me if you think that's the source that produces the largest fraction of electricity. How about coal? How about nuclear? How about solar and so on. And what I saw was, you know, hands all over the room uh, for each one of those sources, kind of a tie vote for each of them. Really, people were out of touch, and it was embarrassing back in those days. It's not nearly as fun to do that exercise anymore, because the hands all go up when I say coal. Um, America has become much more knowledgeable about energy issues now than it was even a decade or two ago. So it's an interesting case. Political scientists love to hammer on the American public saying how embarrassing it is that people do poorly on quizzes. But when it comes to energy, uh, people are remarkably in touch. And I think maybe it's not that surprising uh, the issue has touched many people's lives and dominated news coverage for a long time. Um, so uh, we have not done those kinds of quizzes ourselves in surveys recently. And so it would be interesting to explore, um, you know, the extent to which people are in touch with the facts about, um, uh, and back in that study that Ray and I did, we were not only looking at how accurate people's understandings were of sources of electricity, but also how accurate their understanding of the attributes of those sources were. Did they know which was the cheapest? Did they know which was the most polluting? Did they know which was the most, had a supply that would last the longest and so on? And we found lots of misunderstandings then, and it'd be fun to explore whether educating people um, on that um, led to changes of opinions. Um, we did not, in what we saw back then, when we corrected their misunderstandings, we didn't see much change of preferences. Um, uh, I will say that that work was supported partly by the EPA. So, helpful. 
question. Um, J.C. Burton from Emerald Cities Collaborative. I have got a two-part question, one for Dr. Sharp and then one for Dr. Kosnick. Have you, has your research seen or shown that there are policies that are supporting the idea of workforce around sustainability, especially around retrofits and, re and trying to move and position um, assets to, to embrace renewables? That's the first question. Then second, um, because of that, those policies that may or may not be in place, are you seeing that Americans are trending towards wanting policy to help govern ourselves or as a, a, a marching order or, sh or way to get us from coal, which they don't support, to renewables of any kind? Well, I think uh, the polling part of that I'll leave to John. Um, <clears throat> if I understood your question on the first one on renewables, we have not done a sort of labor studies, if that's what you were asking, about what is the, the uh, job impact of the different choices of the renewable subsidies uh, kind of propositions. And frankly, I think those are probably, to be honest with you, very difficult to get a, a lot of accurate information about as you I think we're articulating there's a different character in the kinds of jobs that you can end up with, uh, with different uh, uh, choices. Uh, and there's also a theoretical question of what do you count as a green job? I mean, you need accountants to make sure you run the business for windmills just like you need somebody to manufacture windmills. So I don't have a, a we don't have that information for you. Others have done some work on that. I think maybe paraphrasing your second question, um, do Americans want government to push us in the direction of renewables? And what I can tell you is that you know we've we haven't asked that question as a as a broad principled single question, but I feel comfortable answering your question based upon answers to lots of specific questions that we've asked over the years in this arena. And what we see is there we've really looked at three different kinds of ways in which government could push the country. One is through mandates or standards where there are requirements, cafe standards and others like that, that's, that tell businesses how they must conduct their activities. Um, there are positive incentives like tax breaks for doing the right things, this in quotes, and then there are negative incentives, tax increases to punish uh, desired uh, behavior that we desire to, to reduce, perhaps one could argue. Um, and what we found is that that last category is not particularly popular. Punishing undesirable behavior doesn't appeal to people, even it's when it's not their own behavior. Um, that incentivizing uh, desired behaviors is more positive and that mandates or standards are even more positive than that. So it does, uh, there, you know, as you saw, there's lots and lots of evidence from this survey and others that Americans do favor government activity and restrictions, interventions into the business world to reduce emissions um, and to do so in the form of either standards or incentivizing in a positive way. I'll just say as an old <coughs> recovered politician, that I found, given the intensity of public debate over the last half a dozen years on this issue of government regulation and whatnot, and the worries of the economy, it was surprising to me the continuing strength of the willingness of the population to engage in mandates, essentially, what we would call mandates, that is necessarily the way the language always works, <clears throat> and to regulate and to uh, favor that as a high option. <laughs> And I must say, other polls that I've seen that have specifically asked questions about standards, codes, and standards over the course of the last 20 years have always come in very, very strongly in support of, of whether it's cafe standard appliance standards, but, but utilizing that approach has always been very popular. Okay, next question. Yeah, I'm James Frank from the uh, Department of the Treasury. I was wondering if your research had looked into mm -hmm. any attitudes about supporting mitigation or adaptation in other countries, so the U.S. supporting developing countries that are suffering from climate change? Yeah, we, we have not yet explored whether the U.S. should address the effects of climate change in other countries or should encourage re reductions in emissions in other countries and so on. And that's a very interesting direction to go in. I will tell you, we, uh, we are now uh, hoping to do a project, we have a proposal out under consideration, 
to do certainly the most ambitious measurement we've ever done on this issue. Uh, you may know that the Gallup organization runs something called the World Poll, in which they uh, do interviews in hundreds of countries with representative, scientifically uh, solid samples uh, of, of the residents of those countries. And we are hoping to ask a sequence of questions for the first time ever um, on climate change and related issues identically across all of those countries, to be able to start picking up opinions of people in those countries. That's different from the issue you raised. And I think it, uh, we may be able to get to your issues more quickly than we'll get the, national, the, in the international survey work done, but we hope to do both. Um, but that's where I must say that I was also really, really impressed by the number that you cited in terms of people saying that we should take steps to prepare, which I found really staggering, actually, in terms of that. And one could think about that in terms of what that means both domestically as well as um, internationally as well. Other questions? Okay, back here. Hi, uh, Lucas Befera, C2ES. Um, excellent work, Professor. Really nicely done. Uh, that number, the 91% that favor solar, is really an excellent and very encouraging number. Um, but I'm curious, um, how do you think that number would change if you mentioned that the bulk of those panels are being imported from China? Yeah, the, I think there are a number of, of uh, arguments that you could make. In fact, the project I referred to earlier um, that Ray and I did looking at people's understanding of sources of energy, um, not only could one say, well, look, you know, if, you're, if we're um, producing lots more solar power now than we had before, we're going to be pumping a lot of money into the Chinese economy because those are the inexpensive panels. That's where consumers will go. Uh, you, you might imagine to some people that might be a negative. Um, it's also true that, uh, as I understand it, that production of uh, electricity from uh, solar power is not that inexpensive. Um, and there are issues even of the production of waste products from solar power that are not trivial. And so educating people about a series of potential drawbacks could well change their impressions. Um, and so this raises an interesting contrast for surveys like I do. So one is to say, maybe my job is to measure what people think today, and that's what I've described to you. And another way to think about it is we could measure what people would think if they had other sets of information. And that can be interesting as well, and that's what you're highlighting. And uh, I think if, if Ray and I ever get back to really redoing again that project we did years ago, we would be giving people lots of new information to educate them about the pros and cons of various different sources of energy, and who knows where they would move. Um, okay, any other questions? Because I wanted to ask you what you found out with regard to fracking. Thank you. So we actually did in this survey ask a series of questions on fracking. Um, the, the first question we asked was whether people were familiar with fracking. And what we found is that there was a substantial number of Americans, uh, was it about a third, Pete, maybe, who did not remember hearing about it. And... Um, among those who had heard about it, um, what we saw was that there was uh, considerable uh, support for government effort to monitor and regulate the process to be sure that it was safe. Did I cover all the key points there? Or was there? Survey 2013, the exact wording and results of the questions are there. So, we'll say one more time. RFF.org slash climate survey 2013. All smushed together. Great. Any other questions or comments? You've got this guy here right now on your <laughs> side. So anyway, um, and, and I must say there were some of the questions I think that 
certainly lead to additional questions that we would all love for you to be looking at. And, um, and once again, I think that it is absolutely fascinating in terms of what you're finding and in terms of some of the consistency. And I, from looking at things from a congressional perspective, it, it's, I find it absolutely um, uh, so interesting in terms of looking at those maps and, and the really high percentages across the country that I think are, is really important for everybody to really be aware of and to, to look at. Um, the briefing today, uh, the video will be on EESI's website, so please feel free to go back and look at that if you want to get more information and to pick up some of the things that have been presented by, by Dr. Krosnick, and you've also got the RFF um, uh, address so that you can get more and more information there as well as, do you want to say the Stanford um, uh, website address too where you had some of your other if, if I had it memorized, I would be happy to share it with you. But if you put my last name into Google and put PPRG, you will find it quickly. Okay. That's, that's what I wanted you to do. Okay, great. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very, very much, John. And thank you very, very much, Phil, for being here. preeminent research project exploring voter decision making. So, Dr. Krasnick. Thank you very much, Carol, and welcome to you all. It's really a pleasure to be back in this building, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this new work that we've done. I want to just begin by letting you know who you should join me in thanking for what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, I'm very grateful to Resources for the Future and Pete Nelson there in particular, who's been a collaborator in this project and uh, who made this all possible. Um, Stanford and the Woods Institute for the Environment in particular has been a supporter in USA Today. Uh, our polling partner there, Jim Norman, has been uh, at very important in pulling this off as well. The research staff includes Yu Shuang Wang at RFF and my longtime collaborator at Stanford, Bo McInnes. And so I wanted to thank all of those folks as well as Alan Krupnik and Ray Kopp at RFF. So any questions you have about details, feel free to ask any of those people. Um, so um, what we're going to do today is begin with a point of deep embarrassment and concern for me. And this has nothing to do with climate change at the moment. Let me just show you this graph. Um, this looks complicated. It's really not that, that complicated. It's very simple. These are poll results taken between April of 2010 and April of 2011 asking the American public a very simple question. Was Barack Obama born in the United States or born in another country? Okay? And the y-axis over here is the percent of people who gave the right answer, in a, uh, who said that he was born in the United States. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are very happy to welcome you to this briefing this afternoon, talking about public attitudes about climate change and clean energy. And of course, it's a very fitting topic as we think about the State of the Union is about to be delivered tonight. So this is an issue that may very well be addressed in some way during the State of the Union. It certainly is on the minds of policymakers as we look at many of the issues that are confronting the Congress and confronting state and local leaders uh, as we deal with more and more issues around energy and climate. We are very pleased to be holding this briefing uh, today and as a result of new work that has been done by Professor John Krosnick. Some of you may have been at previous briefings where uh, Professor Krosnick has talked about his findings and 
we think that it is a very, very good opportunity to hear sort of the latest, get those perceptions, to have a better understanding of what the American public is. And you can see that each of these little uh, objects represents a pole measurement, and the lines connect up measurements made with the same survey question. So if we just look back here in April 2010, you can see that according to this survey, the per percent of giving the correct answer was about 78% in the country. According to this measurement, it was 64%. And according to this one, it was 58%. So you can see very substantial disagreements between these low numbers and these high numbers. But the, what the lines show you is that there is consistency in question wording. If you ask the same question at different times, you get very similar answers. So that to take those lines out and, and to make these all dots, you would say, what a mess, why should I believe polling? Who knows what the American public believes? But actually what I'm showing you is that question wording matters. And that's an obsession for us, and it's particularly important with regard to climate change, because this is a comparable graph here with dots and no lines, showing you between 1986 and 2013, many national polls asking Americans in one way or another, has the earth been warming or not? And you can see that even most recently, these measurements range from dots around 50% to dots around 80% or 90%. So if you were wondering, should I pay attention to polls? You might look at data like this and say, why would I bother? Because who knows if there's any truth there. But the fact of the matter is, if I were to connect dots with the same wordings here as well, you'd see the same thing. Consistency over time and results. And what I'm going to do is to walk you through results that we get with a set of questions that are based across the country and across a whole range of demographics that make it all very interesting to learn more about what the current state of, of thinking really is. And of course, there are always more questions that need to be asked. We're going to hear uh, a lot of new information today. And of course, this work that has uh, just been completed in December had been commissioned through the re uh, uh, resources uh, for the future and USA Today. Uh, and so we are very, very pleased also to be holding this briefing in conjunction with resources for the future and to have the president of RFF here with us to also make comments at this afternoon and to provide some very, very useful context, I think, particularly for, for policymakers since we have someone who was a very prominent policymaker um, who is now leading RFF. So at this time, without further ado, I would like to turn to Dr. Krosnick who has been looking at public opinion for more than 30 years, looking at how the American public attitudes are formed, how they are shaped, how they are changing, and how it affects their thinking in action and how it may indeed affect how policymakers feel. He's been an expert, recognized uh, worldwide, uh, looking at the psychology of attitudes, particularly in the area of politics, and has been a co-principal investigator of the American National Election Study, which has been a based on 100 years of literature developing across the social sciences in how to design questions to minimize bias and measure what people really think as accurately as we can. So that's what we're going to do. And to put it in context, I'm just going to show you one recent headline. This happens to come from NBC News. Number of Americans who don't believe in climate change rises. And this is dated just January 16th of 2014. So this is reporting the result of a poll. So let's, is it true that skepticism is on the rise? Let us find out. So what I'm going to do is walk you through a series of national surveys that we have done, and the great focus here is on the newest one. So the newest one, as I mentioned, is co-sponsored by Resources for the Future, USA Today, and Stanford. The, the data were collected uh, very recently in, in uh, November and December um, at the end of last year. And we've asked lots of new questions, exploring lots of new issues that we haven't in our surveys before. But we've also asked a number of questions that we have asked quite often that allow us to track trends over time. So in these surveys, the surveys beginning as early as 1997 and going through 2013, these are always with representative random samples of American adults who are interviewed by telephone, landlines and cell phones are called. We randomly select a respondent from among 
the household residents so that we don't have a bias toward people who are at home at the time of the call and we call back as many times as we need to in order to interview the randomly selected respondent. Um, we also work hard at asking unbiased, balanced questions. Um, so to begin, what I want to show you is an update